Uh, welcome everyone to the second of our digital conference talks for this evening. Uh, this evening, we um, in the se our second talk, we're going to be looking at um, ways um, at, for how we can make sense of complex topics using a human-centered design approach. I'm uh, being presented by Luma Institute and Mural. Um, before um, we continue, however, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands in which um, we're uh, streaming and people are watching from. Um, uh, where I am st uh, streaming this from, I acknowledge the uh, Yagara and the Torrible people um, uh, within the Brisbane region. Um, I acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the various lands from where all of you are watching and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples participating in Guthac. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. So, um, I would like to um, welcome uh, Robert Malkin um, and Phil uh, Bickerdike um, this evening to talk to us um, more about making sense of complex topics using a human-centered uh, design approach. So over to you, uh, Rob and Phil. Good evening, everybody. My name's Rob. And Hi, everyone. I'm Phil. So together we are Luma Institute and Mural. And welcome to GovHack. It's on a beautiful evening here in the middle of winter. Um, to start us off tonight, what we're going to talk about a little bit is collaborative intelligence. So what is Mural? Mural is a collaborative intelligence platform. It's a whiteboard centered around digitally collaboration space where teams work in real time, asynchronously, to unlock the genius within, the genius that Mural can help you inspire to bring out of yourselves, taking insights and ideas. Mural's been around for uh, since 2011. We have over $200 million of funding, 95% of Fortune 100 companies. And in the Australian New Zealand landscape, we have things like data residency, where your data stays. We have um, one of the most encrypted and secure systems in the world for what we do. And we have large customers from federal agencies to state and city base. So we're really, really happy to be here tonight. So I'm going to just talk to you a little bit more about what collaborative intelligence systems all about. When we think about the way that companies used to work before the pandemic and the way you work today, you have these collaboration spaces. And we have the Collaboration Design Institute where you develop your skills in your methods. And then you have insights called collaboration insights, right? And the whole time you're working on your web, your, your, your processes and the way that you do guided workflows. And then you have your community people coming in and helping. And all the time you're meeting or doing async or a digital first or a modern workday, whatever your term is, you're trying to get the best out of everybody to solve the problems of your workspace, your university, your class, or your family life. And this is where a collaborative intelligence system, the first of its kind, really comes into play. And we developed some hybrid, you know, collaboration principles, working with some of our biggest customers. And, you know, when we talk about hybrid, we want to make it a collaboration process to solve people problems first. You got to foster a multidisciplinary conversation around solutions, how to do it. There's not a right way. There's not a wrong way. There's multiple ways. How do you bring that human centered design aspect into it? You know, look at how fluid movement to make the location irrelevant. We're a hybrid first company at Mural, over a thousand people around the world. We don't have offices. There's people everywhere at any time. It doesn't necessarily need to be meetings. It could be async. And we really work on role-based coordination. But we also update our communication, our processes, but we think digital first, physical second. So hybrid collaboration isn't a burden to overcome. It's an opportunity to change the way you work. And today I'm very happy to be partnered with Phil, who's part of our Luma Institute, to really talk about Luma and the way you go about solving some of these complex systems. So before I turn it over to Phil, inside the chat, if you have any questions, please put them in there and I'll answer in real time. And we'll probably leave a few minutes at the end um, 
for any uh, live questions and we'll share this mural in the chat and a couple other things for you that you can have takeaways for tonight. So enjoy the session and thank you for being with us tonight. Over to you, Phil. Great, thanks Rob. So yeah, a little bit about Luma. Um, let me take you up here. So, so who are Luma? Well, Luma uh, is an organization that equips teams uh, and organizations to accelerate information and transformation. And we do this every day all around the world. We've, we've been around uh, for about 12 years now uh, and we have a, a global footprint. You can see there that we've, uh, we've delivered our programs and we have instructors based all over the world. And some of the organizations that we've helped enable with this capability for collaboration and human-centered design, um, you'll see there. So many, many organizations in the public sector, um, also consultancies and, and other um, large corporates that we work with here and around the world. And uh, very excitingly, in, uh, in April uh, this year, Luma joined with Mural. So we're now one company. Um, and in doing that, we created this new collaborative intelligence system that, that Rob's just spoken about briefly. Um, so we're, we're very excited to be a, a part of Mural. And, and Mural is a great capability uh, as a place to create that collaboration space to actually enable collaborative work, uh, be it fully online or working remotely. Or even if you're working in person, then there's great opportunities to utilize Mural as a, as a space in which you can do your work. And then um, Luma brings uh, an approach to actually building skills and, and enabling us to collaborate in a better way. So that's what I'd like to share with you uh, today and give you some examples of that. You referenced this uh, skills outlook from the World Economic Forum. And uh, every few years, the World Economic Forum looks at a review of the skills that, that are growing Within, uh, within the global workforce and also those that are declining. And often the reason we come to participate in things like hackathons and like GovHack is to try and enable ourselves to build new skills and learn new things. And so you'll see here on the left, some of those skills that we see are growing, uh, those skills around analytical thinking and innovation, around uh, creativity, originality and using your initiative, around critical thinking and analysis, around complex problem solving, leadership, social influence, um, problem solving and ideation, systems analysis and evolution. These are all of the sorts of skills that you need to, uh, to enhance your opportunities um, to, uh, to, to do new work and create new value. And that's certainly a lot of the skills that you're going to have the opportunity to practice by participating in GovHack. So underpinning these skills, um, Luma talks about three core skill sets. We talk about looking where we're about observing human experience and gathering information. Um, we, we then talk about understanding as another core skill set that helps us to look at the things we've collected and make sense of the world, make sense of the situation that we're in, and then making. And that, that's the group of skills that allows us to bring to life uh, and, and envision future possibilities. And so within those three skill sets, we have um, defined the LUMA system and the LUMA system of methods. You'll see here they're organized under those three skill set pillars of looking, understanding, and making. And within each of those uh, core skill sets, there, is a, there are 12 methods and they've been organized into subcategories. One of the cool things about the Luma system is that it can be uh, applied to many different contexts, many different situations, and it's, it's extremely flexible. So you can use this to address everyday challenges. And when we're talking about the sort of challenges that we're going to be working on in the GovHack program, it's really these complex, complex social challenges, complex um, challenges within, the, within our communities that we want to try and address. And, and um, the Luma methods can help us to, um, to bring a human-centered approach to the work that we do. And this is for everyone. So we may think of ourselves, you know, not necessarily as designers, um, but whatever challenge you're facing, whatever, whatever um, role you, you, you may play, um, there's an opportunity for you to think about how do you apply a more human-centered approach to the work that you do and utilize the Luma system in, in, a, in a way to do that. And it's all about making collaboration better. One of the core things that we do when we come together in, a, in an event like a hackathon is we want to collaborate. We want to make the most of the opportunity to, to build something, create something new with, with, uh, with our teammates um, and, uh, and to get the best out of everybody that, that uh, we are working with. So that's really what we're, we're hoping to uh, help you with today. And just to, uh, to elaborate a little bit about the Luma system, and why it might be different to other approaches around human-centered design. It's helpful to think of the Luma system like common food types in your kitchen and pantry. So 
we know we've got lots of different food types, we've got fruits, vegetables, proteins. And if we want to make a meal, we take the ingredients, the different food types, and we combine them according to a recipe to make a meal. And, uh, and so you'll see there's different ingredients required and a different recipe to follow if you want to make different sorts of dishes. And so just like a chef uh, does in the kitchen, when we think of the Luma system in the same way, we use recipes to create outcomes by combining the, the ingredients, which are the individual different Luma methods that we have, and through combinations of, of recipes, combinations of those methods, we are able to then combine those in ways to actually achieve outcomes in the work that we want to do. So the Luma system is not a process, it's actually a, a very flexible system that we can apply to many different challenges in different contexts. So let me give you an example of, um, of how you can use the Luma system. Uh, so this is a, a recipe um, that's available to you uh, to use. Um, and you'll see there's a number of different Luma methods in this recipe, which is about reframing a problem to inspire new solutions. Um, sometimes when we come at a problem, uh, we may have different ideas, different things that we might consider the problem to be about. And, um, and so it's, it's really helpful for us to go through a process of firstly reframing that, that, that problem and then using that as a springboard to then think about really new and innovative solutions. So you'll see there's a number of different methods that we can use here to help us do that. Beginning with framing the problem, then coming up with ideas, prioritizing those ideas, and then maybe presenting back those ideas in order to get some feedback. Now, uh, for further uh, illustration of this recipe, I'm going to take us to our online platform, Luma Workplace, and I'm going to show you how you can use this recipe um, to, uh, to achieve great outcomes with your, with your challenges, and also how you can utilize Mural as a way to actually uh, collaborate with your teams. So if I just double click on this image here, it's gonna take me to Luma Workplace. I'm gonna sign myself in here. And there we go. This is the recipe page uh, that we find on Luma Workplace. Luma Workplace is our online platform. It has a, a whole lot of resources that are available um, to support you in using the Luma system in your work. And I'll, I'll give you a bit of a walkthrough uh, of that in a moment. But just here on this recipe, I want to fit, quickly walk you through one example of how you can use the Luma system um, to achieve some great outcomes in, in, in solving complex problems. So you'll see here on this page, this is uh, our recipe page. And just like a, a cookbook, you can follow this recipe step by step in order to apply these methods to your challenge. Um, we begin with the agenda here. And it has um, a, a list here of all of the different methods that we, uh, we can apply. And so to begin with, to challenge our preconceptions about a problem and then go beyond brainstorming to inspire some really wild ideas. Often we find that the, the most innovative and, and most compelling ideas are not the obvious ones. They're the ones that, that really um, come when we stretch our thinking into, into um, new and interesting spaces. And so this recipe is designed to help us do that. But we begin with framing the problem and we use a method called abstraction ladder uh, or abstraction laddering to do that. And together we can discuss the scope of the problem to better understand how broad or narrow our approach should be. And uh, we've got some detailed steps here that you can, you can look at, which will guide you step by step in how to actually apply this method um, to your challenge. Um, the abstraction ladder really helps you to navigate that problem Firstly, by exploring, well, why does this problem exist? And there's an example here to guide you through that. Um, why, why, we, why we work on this challenge? Why is it important? Um, to give us a broader perspective. And then we can turn our focus to, well, how do we actually approach this problem? What are the different aspects of the problem that we can investigate? Given that we've got limited time uh, within the context of our hackathon, um, how, how might we approach this in a way that can, we can make some meaningful progress on this idea? On, on this challenge. So that's our first method. And then the output of, of that abstraction ladder uh, activity is going to be a whole bunch of different, what we call problem frames, different perspectives on the challenge itself. Some of them will be a broader perspective. Some of those will be a more narrow perspective. And we can then use that to prepare what we call opportunity statements using a, a technique called statement starters. So every, every uh, team member will look at the exploration you've done in the abstraction ladder and then think about a way to rephrase that into a, 
a, a new statement that really helps us to in, invite broad exploration. And a great technique to doing that um, is using a, a, a statement starter, how might we? When we use those three little words, how might we? It really does help us to um, frame a problem in such a way that's going to um, firstly invite collaboration. Um, secondly, it's going to open up our possibilities and think about you know, what possibly could be. And then it's going to um, give us a sense of action so we can actually do something about this. So that technique of statement starters can be really helpful for aligning your team and determining how you want to approach your, your work together. The next method in our recipe here is, is a way to actually then move into brainstorm, so exploring new possibilities. And we do that through a method called creative matrix. So you take the, the statements, the problem statements that you have crafted from the previous step, and then you can use those um, as, as the focal point for your brainstorming activity. And so using, uh, using this technique of a creative matrix, which you will see here, uh, the step-by-step -step instructions, um, we could position those new problem statements at the top of our column. Um, and then um, the, the, we can choose a set of enablers. And these enablers are ways in which we could then um, use uh, the levers we can pull essentially. It could be sources of data that we have available to us. It could be different ways of actually developing applications towards um, solving challenges, but ways that are going to help us to achieve uh, the, uh, some, some new and creative ideas. And the idea is uh, around the creative matrix is a way to actually organize our brainstorming activities is to try and stimulate more creativity. So just to give you a sense of focus to where your ideas are coming from and should be designed in such a way that helps you to stretch your thinking beyond some of those obvious ideas. And so that becomes our third method in the recipe. Then once we have created um, a, a large number of ideas, and um, typically using a creative matrix, you'll, you'll find it will create many, many more ideas than other conventional brainstorming activities. So then you can choose a short list of your ideas. We suggest maybe 10 or 12 of those ideas that have come from your brainstorming activities. Um, and then you can start to prioritize these ideas into opportunity areas using a technique called the importance difficulty matrix. And this is a way for you as a team to discuss the relative importance and difficulty of the proposed potential solutions or ideas that you have come up with. Um, and so you'll see some detailed steps here on how to actually go about doing that. Um, firstly, we wanna focus on importance and, and, and we wanna try and organize our ideas according to how important they are in terms of solving the challenge, in terms of the value that they are going to be delivering to the people that we are in service of. It's really important to consider um, what, what value um, is going to be offered by these ideas and think about it through the lens of the people that we are in service of. We're, doing, we're taking a human-centered approach to this, thinking about the humans that are involved, um, those people that are going to be the beneficiaries of the idea that you have in mind. And, and think about it in such a way that is um, trying to give a, a, a sense of how much value or how much, uh, uh, how much of a difference it's going to make in the lives of those people. And so as a group, you want to have a, a really robust conversation there around the, the relative importance or impact that each of your ideas might have uh, and organise them according to their, their relative importance. And then once you've done that, then you start to bring this other lens to it, which is the difficulty. Difficulty being... How hard is it going to be for us to go ahead and implement any of these ideas? Um, things that, you know, cost could be a factor that, that comes into difficulty. The technical complexity could be an issue that comes into, into play. Um, things like the, the, the adoption or, or of, of your ideas, or it could be um, limiting factors like, like uh, regulations or, or, or those sorts of things that need to be considered when, you, when you're thinking about how difficult it would be to bring this to life. And the reason for doing this um, prioritization activity is allows you to focus on those uh, ideas that are going to offer you the best opportunity to make some meaningful progress within the time frame that you have. Because you want to have something that's to be able to demonstrate, something to be able to tell a great story about. And so by actually laying out all of your ideas and then looking at it from a, a critical point of view, it can then help to guide you towards those ideas that you think are going to have the best potential um, to do something meaningful within the context of the, the hackathon.
So once we've de developed those, uh, those ideas in terms of where they fit within their relative importance and difficulty, we can then make a tangible representation of those ideas. Um, we could jump straight into building something, um, but another way to approach that, another making method is to use a technique called a concept poster. And a concept poster is a really great way for you to actually get, uh, take that idea that you have, which might be just a few words on a, on a post-it, and flesh out some more of the details around that idea itself. It can help you to consider important factors and, and start to be able to get you to think about what does this idea really mean? How is this idea actually going to work? And what sort of um, clear value is it going to deliver? It's kind of like the first step towards building a business case around your idea and helping you to get into the mode of telling a story about that idea as well. And then once you've created that artifact of the concept poster, then you can move into um, the final step here in our recipe, which is critique. And critique is a way to actually present your idea in a way. Now you have a concept poster, something that's tangible, something that's visual. You can then present that to your teammates or to other, other people. Um, could be some people that you're, you're hoping to deliver the service if you have access to those people. And you can get some opportunities to get some feedback from them on aspects of your idea that might work, might not work and further refine your idea. And so there's, um, there's detailed steps here on how to actually go about that. Starting with, what do you like about this concept? What are some of the positive things that you, you might um, find in, in this idea that we're presenting? What are some of the challenges you might face? So um, some of the opportunity, the, the areas where um, it may not be working so well, or it may be um, difficult to actually execute upon. And then finally, how might we build on this idea? So what you're doing there is you're asking the people that you're presenting this idea to to actually then make that idea even better and, and enhance any of the aspects of that. So this is our recipe um, as an example of something that you might be able to try within the context of the work that you're doing. So I've walked you through there the recipe details pretty rapidly. If you want any further information on any of the individual um, methods within this recipe, you can click on the, on the name here of the method, and it will take you to the method page on the workplace. Um, but what I really wanted to demonstrate to you here, which is a really, really powerful feature of, of uh, Limbo Workplace, particularly when we're working with, uh, with teams in a hybrid or, or even a remote um, uh, modality. If I click on use template now, we can open this template directly into Mural. And this is, um, really quite a powerful, powerful feature. So what we see here, that recipe that I just walked you through and gave you um, some uh, introduction to has been mapped out into a mural board that you can begin to start to use immediately. So you have here um, the, the, the uh, template for the first method, abstraction ladder, and that's been set up in a way that you can begin to use that with your team. Um, the next step, Statement starters, you have see, you, you see here there's um, some preparation steps like typing people's names into each space before the session. So if everybody can nominate their own place and then start to then generate some of those problem statements using that technique. You can then move that directly over to your next method, which is the creative matrix. Taking your problem statements. So you'll see here as highlighted on the board, some in situ guidance on how to actually apply this. Um, moving your statements into the creative matrix and then using this to actually generate your ideas. Onto the importance difficulty matrix where you can start to lay out and prioritize those ideas. And then a template for the concept poster that's gonna help you to flesh that out before moving into an area here for critique to um, collect and, and discuss the next steps on your idea. So that integration from Luma Workplace where we find the recipe gives us a step-by-step -step guide on how to do that can be launched directly into Mural where you can start to actually do the collaborative work with your teams. All you need to do there is click on this button, create the Mural from the template, and you can directly create that, that Mural for yourself and share that with your teams that you're collaborating with. So let me go take us back to my main Mural here. Do we have anything in the chat, Rob? Any questions that people are throwing up there at the moment? There was one question so far about if we have live data in Mural, and we'll answer that in the uh, YouTube at the end. Mm -hmm. Jason, I think that was the only question so far. 
Awesome. So just in closing today, um, the, uh, there's a few things that we wanted to, um, to leave you with today. Um, firstly, the, the Luma Workplace platform, if I just quickly go back to that again. Um, now, when you first launch Luma Workplace, um, it's really focused on how we can actually enable. And, and uh, I've given you one example of a recipe that you might find useful, um, but it's a great platform to explore different approaches to actually solving your challenges and taking a human-centered design approach. You will find when you first come into uh, Luma Workplace some great suggestions on how to actually approach um, any of the challenges that you're facing. If you want to browse the methods themselves, you can go to this drop down of methods and browse all 36 methods in the Luma system uh, and to, to find out more information about any of these methods. Um, if we look at um, one of those methods, for instance, um, in problem framing abstraction ladder, that first one, You'll find here not only recipes that use that, that method, link directly from that method page, but some helpful videos on providing tips and advice on how to actually approach that. Um, and some, uh, some examples of how other teams have done that using, using mural, um, but also using um, physical materials when they're co-located together. So there's um, some great uh, resources there for all of the methods in the learning system that you can, you can um, look to. So if we just go back up here, I think we've got a couple of minutes left just to wrap up some of the resources that we're gonna um, share with you today um, that you have um, access to. So um, Rob, do you wanna tell us about this? Absolutely. Um, so if you go to mural.co, um, murals, um, we have a free version of the software. Um, probably a lot of people tonight can take advantage of that being students or a part of organizations. Um, and on our mural.co, there's a principle, uh, a paper called collaborative intelligence that you can download and actually get four or five pages of some really great ideas on how to um, integrate your teams and think about how, like going back to the collaboration principles and really how to make, you know, you can read the tagline there, reimagining how teams work together because we're not going to probably physically be in the same room. And when we are, there's going to be limits on the number of people. And there's going to be people on the other side of the country and the other, you know, in other countries, how to make that, that digital experience or that experience excellent and even surpasses a physical in, in room um, meeting. And again, mural.co, there's, you can up in the right to sign up free forever. Excellent. So free access to the mural platform. Um, also, as a special offer for GovHack participants, we're also, um, we've set up a page here where you can sign yourself up to three months access to Luma, work, uh, Luma Workplace. So that's, that's from the Luma Institute page, uh, exclusively for participants within GovHack and, and, and also um, people that are involved in that event. So you can take advantage of that access to Luma Workplace, pair that with your access to Mural, and you'll be able to do some really powerful things there, collaborating with your teams. Fantastic. So with that, I think um, we're, we're really excited to, um, to say thank you and, and open it up if there are any further questions before we wrap up today. Okay. Oh, that was a... Um, a a, a, an insightful talk. So we do have a couple of questions and I have some of my own as well. So the question that um, Rob was um, pointing out that we got asked on the uh, YouTube chat was, um, does Mural have the ability to present live data? Um, considering that um, a lot of our problems um, that are presented in GovHack um, get either people to use um, static data or live uh, real-time data. Um, in what way can people work with this with inside a mural? So inside a mural, you can easily bring data in. You can use something like Power Automate if you're on a Microsoft system, or actually you can bring a link and that link will actually bring in the data. It just depends where the data source is coming from, but by and large, you know, it's, you can bring data in, you can use data. Is it live? It's not going to be, you know, instant, but it could be a couple seconds or a couple of minutes, just how often you want to do it in the systems you have. But by and large, you can use things like Power Automate and make things happen, Power BI. Awesome. So um, in my day job, I work at a university. Um, I have 
330 students in my current course that I'm teaching. Um, yeah. About 200 of them are in here, uh, at Brisbane here in Australia, and then the rest of them are located in many different countries around um, the world at the moment. Um, so what sort of ways would you suggest that people could utilize um, these platforms to work through these design-based problems? So I'll, I'll capture it and then I'll get turn it to Phil. So we work, we have, I think it was the last count, over 3,500 universities around the world that utilize Mural, Jason, um, all around Australia, New Zealand, and a lot of other countries. So there's this, like, there's the free version or there's education programs. Like if you're being a professor and you're teaching classes, you can do it on, on the Mural side. And then Phil can talk about the Luma side in education. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, so... I think one, one thing we've got to be careful about is when we're working with people, don't leave our collaboration to chance. Make sure you design the way in which you collaborate in a way that's going to get you the best outcomes. And when you're working with a group of people like that, you know, a large group of students, everybody has a unique perspective. Everybody has different experiences and value to bring. And, and looking at some of the opportunities to use the learner system and guide it through some of those recipes can help you really get the best out of coming together and working together. Um, we would recommend an on Luma workplace. You'll see some, some recommendations about how many people to, to do some of the methods with. Um, there are, there's not many methods that you would be using to uh, do, do, do an activity with 100 people in one group. So what we do in those cases is we break it into subgroups and we think about how can you create a, a group of people, a smaller group of people, and then bring perhaps the outputs of those smaller groups together to share it a larger, in, a, in a larger group. Um, and, and in terms of um, where, where we actually have opportunities to build these skills, of course, we have access to them in the workplace, but we also do offer a public, um, a public program where people can come and be trained as certified practitioners of the Luma system as well. And uh, we're, we're going to be offering uh, a discount to those programs as well. So if people do want to further their education in, 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 in human-centered design and, and, and learn more about we sort of say the learning system is like a common language of how we actually talk about innovation and design, then um, that, that's an opportunity that they can do to explore that too. Okay. Uh, th uh, that sounds great. Um, one of the things that when you were going through on how you design um, and ask questions, that's one of the things that we also try and focus on um, when we're getting the um, our sponsors to design challenges. We try and get them to come at it from a human-centered design approach because um, we find that um, the problem spaces are generally then uh, quite open and they aren't yes. restrictive and going, you must do this uh, for Absolutely. it. Um, yeah, that certainly is very helpful. Yeah. So I've got uh, time for one last question that's just come in. Um, uh, do you have ways within the platform where you can have a child board that is presented within a main board? Yeah, you, you can have a board and you can have a link and then you can click that link and it brings up another board. Yeah, some way of having it so that they're, um, uh, you can uh, link these together so that um, if you have multiple different problem spaces, you can go from one oh, yeah. to another and jump around. Yeah, absolutely. You can take a board like that. You can take that thank you, for example, or you had a board like that and then you had a, a hyperlink in there, click it and it will bring you up to another board. So you can put as many board as you want in, in cluster them almost. You know, the other great thing about inside of Mural, you can do voting, you can do private voting, you can do all kinds of different trend analysis and, and um, you know, things like that inside of Mural as well. Okay. Yeah, one of the cool features of, of Mural too is you can organize your boards into rooms and into, so if you're working together in a team, you can give access to your entire team at that room level. And you can also have folders. So the organization of, of your boards is really quite cool within the Mural platform to keep everything in the right place. All right. Uh, that sounds great. Um, so we're pretty much at time. So is there any suggestions that you have to our uh, um, uh, participants for uh, uh, this weekend when they're working with their data and challenges? Phil? I think my number one suggestion is don't forget about the people, right? And, you know, we do this, we, we're, we're solving challenges for a purpose. We want to make sure we keep a human-centered approach in the way that we do that. So keep those people in mind about who you're actually serving and uh, you'll be on the right track to create some great value. 
Absolutely. And just have fun while you're doing it. You know, so there's a, there's a free version that you guys can start using this weekend, guys and girls. And then, you know, depending on your organization or university there, we have some paid versions and data residency in Australia for our big government clients, banks, but just have fun this weekend and just knock it out of the park. And let's really take that human centered approach to, to solve the problems. Okay. So thank you very much uh, to Phil and Rob for joining me here this evening. Um, and thank you also uh, then to the organizations, Alum Institute um, and uh, Mural. Um, so that concludes our um, digital conference for this evening. Um, we're now looking forward to the Friday night where we will have um, the launch of um, all the different challenges uh, from our sponsors. Uh, so make sure that if you has, are still to register for the event, make sure to register. So if you're coming along to one of the physical events, we know uh, how many people are going to be there so that um, you can get that free food. Um, we don't know how many people are coming. We won't have enough food. So let us know that you're coming uh, for, the, uh, for that food and to start looking at these great challenges from our sponsors. Um, so thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing as many of you at um, the competition weekend as possible. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good luck.